My guest today is Jeffrey Fien Paul. He's a professor of economic history at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on the time. So I'm hoping we could start a little bit with your background. I'm interested to know where where you were born and raised. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm in I'm at an international studies program in the Netherlands, uh, where we have mm -hmm. students from about 60 different countries that I'm teaching on a regular basis. And partially, they chose me to teach there because I have quite the international background myself. Uh, so okay. um, I was born in the US, but then I did my PhD in Canada and lived there for a while. I lived in Mexico for a while, um, and then that inspired me to do Spanish history. So mm -hmm. I've done a lot of okay. the history of the Spanish Empire, and I've lived in Spain and uh, French Belgium and the Netherlands and the UK during the course of my studies and research. Wow. And so uh, did you study languages in each of these areas as well? Yes. Well, um, yeah. as a North American, I'm much better at reading languages than speaking them. And uh, mm -hmm. so I can read about eight different languages as a researcher. They're all Western, basically every language in Western Europe, except for Scandinavian. Um, but I'm not as good at speaking them. I can get by if I have to. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when you were growing up, what were some of the influences or experiences that led to you choosing history as well, yeah. a, a I mean, topic I grew of interest? Up in this really, I grew up in this really interesting town in the United States. Uh, it's called Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and it was named by um, Moravian uh, separatists, I suppose, religious separatists who had settled in Pennsylvania uh, mm -hmm. in the 1730s and 40s. Um, and so that town has this wonderful colonial nucleus from the 18th century, but then it has a fabulous 19th century steel uh, mill and, and urban nucleus as well. So it has, a, you know, about as much history as you're going to be able to have in North America. And mm -hmm. uh, it really got me inspired to travel all around the U.S. and Canada and find all the old colonial towns. Uh, and then that gave me a sort of thirst for, for older things. Um, and so then I went and studied in the UK and got, you know, thoroughly into earlier history, medieval and Roman. Mm -hmm. And with Spanish history, you're focusing on the development of institutions and, and family life in Spain and in the Middle Ages? Is that? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I always had this sort of interest in economics. And so when mm -hmm. I did Spanish history, I went into economic history. So I was looking at the Spanish Empire and really Spanish expansion abroad, but I looked at the economic underpinnings of how and why that worked. And I found out some really interesting you know, things such as, you know, why could the Dutch defeat the Spanish in the 17th century, this tiny little country? How could they defeat the Spanish Empire? Um, and it turns out the, the main reason seems to be that the Dutch were just better at uh, raising money cheaply than the Spanish were. The Dutch created a financial system that enabled them to mobilize capital. Mm -hmm. in a way that the Spanish government never learned how to do. And so the Dutch could uh, build 100 ships for every 10 the Spanish could build. And did that include debt as well, the ability to have uh, have debt in the banking system? Exactly. Financial so the system? whole modern yeah. idea of the modern idea of public debts, which is what every state runs on now, um, was invented by originally the Italians and then taken up by the Dutch. Um, and it works like a credit card where you can expand your tax revenue by 20 or even 100 times. So states that didn't figure out how to do that until later, such as Spain and France and the Ottoman Empire, ended up falling far behind these more financially uh, advanced states. 
So that was okay. part, one of the major interesting things I found about economic history and how I got into the history of, of Spain and the Spanish Empire. Interesting. Because uh, in the Middle Ages, the 16th century or so, Spain developed into quite a powerful empire with its overseas territories and the influx of, was it silver or gold that came into Spain at that time? Yeah, exactly. Well, the interesting thing is Spain got rich simply by mining the silver because back then silver equaled money because all the currencies, of course, were, were pegged to a metallic standard. Um, mm -hmm. But the Spanish didn't yet develop the sophisticated financial techniques to really be able to profit from this capital. So most of the silver they mined, they just spent elsewhere in Europe, basically. It all left Spain okay. almost as soon as it got there. All right. And uh, through doing other research, I saw that you were involved in the development of an academic journal called the Journal of Global History. What's your role with that journal? Yeah, well, or, that's the uh, Journal of Global Slavery. Uh, actually, I uh, did I say global history? Global I meant global history. slavery. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. as an economic historian who was looking at the Spanish Empire, I realized that slaves were one of the major commodities that was traded. And so I developed early on an interest in slaves as sort of an economic good. And what were the economic underpinnings of who got traded where? I found out that in the medieval period, it was actually your religion rather than your race that helped determine whether you were labeled as a, a saleable commodity. And it was only in the early modern period that we started to think about race uh, instead of religion. And so mm -hmm. the whole slaving system actually changed during those centuries. It's a really interesting topic, but that's why we founded the journal to explore these ideas. Okay. It seems seems to me I remember that one of uh, the first foreign policy initiatives with the American Navy, Jefferson sent the Navy to the Mediterranean to protect merchant ships from, uh, was it North African, uh, North African uh, ships or civilizations were attacking them and enslaving them? Does yeah. Does that well, sound right uh, to you? Yeah. They were still operating on the idea that anyone who wasn't of the dominant religion, in this case Muslim, was enslavable. And so that meant mm -hmm. basically Christians and pagans. And so, yeah, the, the, the Barbary states were definitely preying on Christian shipping in the Mediterranean right up through the 19th century. So uh, when was this Journal of Global Slavery established? Or when did it uh, begin? We established it, oh, I'd say around 2015. Um, we had an initiative. We had a bunch of scholars who were working on different aspects of global slavery at Leiden University. One of the best things about my university is we have this huge uh, history department with about 200 faculty. And so we have lots of expertise wow. to do projects like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by by looking at a global perspective, I assume you're comparing uh, different instances of slavery or a slave trade from around the world. What are some insights that you guys have been able to, to get from this method? Well, one of the most interesting things we looked at was slavery in Asia. And the model mm -hmm. there was, was, um, not following the Greco-Roman model, whereas the Greeks and the Romans tended to very distinctly define someone as either a slave or a not slave. And the Muslims and the Christian world both took up that Greco-Roman idea, whereas in the Asiatic world, everybody belonged to somebody else. Everybody was, you know, kind of um, submitted under someone. You know, you were part of a great hierarchy. Uh, mm -hmm. But there were not clear divi uh, divisions always between who was a slave and who was not a slave. It was just a simple okay. case of people being dependent on one another. Mm -hmm. 
And so in the Just... Asiatic model, we've learned you can't use this language of slavery, not slavery, and you have to talk more about dependency and you have to talk about precariousness rather than something mm. so easily defined as slavehood. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it was around 2000 and was it 2001 when you wrote the article for The Spectator? Uh, oh, that, yeah, 2021. Yeah, so just a few 2021. years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, 2020. What, what led to writing that article? And then did you have a book in mind when you were writing that article? Or was it the success of that article that made you decide that writing a book would be a good idea? Yeah, so my, my article in The Spectator was called um, The Myth of the stolen country and right. it was right around 2020 when you know all of the um floyd riots and everything had really brought these new uh ideas of intersectionality to to public discourse in, in a big explosive way mm -hmm. and i started thinking to myself okay um there are there's lots of truth i understand the suffering i understand why people are upset but um, a lot of the rioting is based on readings of history that I thought went a little too far uh, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of Europe bashing. Basically, it ended up becoming sort of open season for every historian to say as many bad things about Europe and Europeans as they could, even if this wasn't factually true. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of the myth of the of the stolen country came out because everyone had started suddenly saying that the United States was basically stolen ground and Canada was basically stolen ground. They weren't legitimate countries at all. They were completely illegitimate. And I remember that as recently as 2016, Bernie Sanders could stand in front of Mount Rushmore and say, this is a, a monument to four great Americans. He said nothing cynical about it at all. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, what is it that's changed in the last four years that we went from having a common ground where Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. could all agree that there was a core set of values about America that made America great, whereas by 2020, we were all saying it was completely illegitimate, it was one of the worst countries in the world, and why had that happened? Mm -hmm. And so I realized a big part of it was this misreading of history, saying that, for example, the first Thanksgiving was all about slaughter and rapine and like the worst possible crimes, torture. Whereas when you look at the real sources, there were definitely bad things that went on, but there were also, there was lots of goodwill and there were people who spent decades trying to get along both on the native side and the European side. Mm -hmm. And I found that articles were just completely ignoring all of these people's lifelong dedication to trying to get along with one another. And so I wrote this article for The Spectator saying, you know, we can't be too simplistic. We have to be reasonable. We have to be kind of centrist. We have to realize that there's good and bad on both sides. Mm -hmm. That article ended up going extremely viral because back then in 2020, if you tried to say anything, you know, pushing back against the extreme anti-Europeanism or being, you know, pro-Europe in any, even a moderate way, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, people freaked out. So it, it had millions of views, but there were a lot of people who agreed with me. I got a note from Steven Pinker. I got a note from really, you know, prominent people saying this is really great stuff. Mm -hmm. So the success of that article then led to a couple different book offers, actually. And they what? said, why don't you expand this into a book? And that's why I ended up um, being able to write the, the book Not Stolen. Okay, great. So the the book Not Stolen, it was published in this year, 2023. And the, I'll just read the subtitle here. It's Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World. So you've Broke, uh, the way you've written the book, you've broken it into four parts. So the first is the third American displacement and fourth 
contemporary issues. So beginning with uh, the first part, uh, you open the book with a chapter on Christopher Columbus. And you, I, I found this an interesting chapter because uh, many years ago, I read Howard Zinn's book, uh, People's History of the United States, and was somewhat alarmed or uh, taken aback to read of uh, words attributed to Columbus on, on meeting Native uh, American Indians for the first time. And in, in this book, he, he, the quote attributed to Columbus is that the natives seemed rather simple and would make good servants. And the takeaway from this is that uh, upon first contact, Columbus's thoughts were that he wanted to enslave these people. And I was really interested to read your book and see that these quotations are not actually, they were put together in a certain way. And when you put the full quotation there, it, it seems to say something different. Could you talk about how you put this together? Absolutely. Well, I mean, first I can allude to the title. You know, the title says the truth about European colonialism. And people have taken that the wrong way as if I think that I know something about absolute truth, which of course is uh, an absurd proposition. What I mean to say is that the truth is complicated. And I mm -hmm. think that what we're missing in our current discourse is that, um, is that yes, the truth has uh, elements from all sides. And in some cases, however, the story that we're being told online in, in every article that references these words of Zinn, I mean, even um, in the TV show Yellowstone, they also reference the same quote, uh, this Columbus quote uh, that mm -hmm. Zinn uses. But this quote is a perfect example of having been cherry picked. So this is the, the kind of truth that most people think uh, they know about Columbus, but it is in fact based on a very much cobbled together statement. So um, Columbus shows wonder about the New World and its natives. He has several passages where he says these people are just as intelligent uh, as anybody in Europe. Uh, he says these people will become great workers once they have been given Spanish technology. They'll be just as clever at employing it as any Spaniard. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say they'll make great servants in the sense that we think. I mean, a lot of people are now trying to interpret that as they'll make great slaves. So I think mm. in, in Yellowstone, they actually interpreted Columbus's words. He does use the Spanish word servidores, servant, and he doesn't say slave. Um, but what he meant was he was talking to Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and queen, and he said these will make great subjects. So he wasn't saying servants, he was saying subjects. And so that's also been taken out of context. Mm -hmm. Because of course, by saying they'll make great subjects, what he's saying is that they'll be great fellow citizens. Uh, so they'll right. be equals. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a number of people at this time, not just Columbus, in the Spanish court were all quoted saying similar things. But Zinn, of course, is a 70s radical Marxist who, whose main project was to make the U.S. look as bad as possible. Mm -hmm. So now Zinn is all of a sudden, with the age of social media, being taken as this great... Whereas for decades, most historians thought that Zinn was far off to one side of the debate. So with Christopher Columbus, uh, how would you assess how he's uh, remembered culturally today? From We don't talk too much about, at least I don't get the sense we talk too much about him in Canada, but I am aware that in America there's a, a Columbus Day and he's he's uh, still a relevant cultural figure. But there are, there's a competing narrative out there that he is responsible for the death of millions of people and that we 
uh, really need to stop uh, treating him as a, a hero or a great adventurer and and start thinking about him as this bad or evil person who came over and uh, to the new world enslaved people and was responsible for the death of up to millions yeah well there there's a number of different elements to this story i mean in some ways columbus is a typical 19th century early 20th century uh, hero that was concocted for the united states to try to create a national myth because that's what every country in europe was doing at that time you know for better or for worse um, then the Italian American community was really promoting Columbus because they were very much persecuted. I mean, my grandmother was Italian. She wasn't allowed to marry my grandfather. She was forbidden to marry him uh, by his parents because she was Catholic. So there was, there was a lot of serious uh, social division that this was attempting to overcome. Um, and then in Latin America, Columbus is celebrated along with it's called race day, and that sounds pretty weird in English, but what they're saying is Latin Americans are acknowledging that they are very much a blend of native and Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so they see Columbus as one of their ancestors because as basically half Spanish and half indigenous, Latin Americans see that they wouldn't be who they were without Europeans. So it's a lot harder for Latin Americans to just kind of, you know, uh, despise Europeans and despise European colonists quite as readily as they can in North America, where very few people have indigenous blood. Um, so the North Americans then, North American academics, can rip on Columbus and call him a colonialist in a way that most people in Latin America will not do. Uh, for example, Mexico is 80% mixed race uh, people and and uh and or indigenous so i think it's maybe only 10 or 15 percent are european mm -hmm. full full-blooded european so south of that border people realize um just how many natives uh are very much uh surviving genetically they're, they're just more mixed but north of the border we can tell these tales that columbus was totally evil he's the reason why there's so few natives and so little mixed blood relatively hmm. and then the lies that they tell about columbus are often based on the the biggest possible exaggerations of population figures so for example the tiny island of hispaniola the genetic studies have recently shown maybe had about forty thousand people well, somebody in the 1970s said, oh, I think they actually had 8 million people. Mm -hmm. And then our first population census from the 1540s shows, oh, there was about 40,000 people on the island. And then when they say there was originally 8 million in 1491, it makes it look as if Columbus was uh, responsible for millions of deaths. But that was made up out of broad cloth. Mm -hmm. So I think you use quite an interesting common sense approach to to show why this is a grossly inflated figure by comparing that island to England, which is one of the more advanced economies in the world. And how, how do the islands compare in terms of geographic size? Well, that's just it. So one of the reasons why you could tell even before the genetic studies came out, um, that Hispaniola only had maximally a couple hundred thousand people, um, was that it's only about 60% the size of England, it's mountainous, and they had only hoe farming techniques, so they used stone hoes rather than plows to grow their food, which means that the number of calories per acre that they can get is much smaller than contemporary England where they had um, metal plows and, and draft animals. Mm -hmm. So. If England had about 2 million people and it was larger and had much more technology, then it stands to reason that Hispaniola is going to have a relatively small fraction of what uh, England had at the time. So that's just common sense. And I have kind of worked that out myself um, just from doing basic tools of economic history. Mm -hmm. uh, and then along comes this genetic study that completely backs up what I had just done through reason. <laughs> 
So that that was good to see. Yeah. Well, so one of the things you deal with in the book is trying to get a best estimate of the populations uh, that existed in North America and South America at the time that uh, Europeans first made contact and and uh, subsequent waves of people came over. So how, how did you go about trying to t figure out, say, with North America, how many uh, Native Americans were living in North America at that time in the 15th century? Well, this is what really comes as a revelation because they talk about the idea of settler colonialism, and maybe we'll get into that later, but the idea that Europeans mm -hmm. went over to the New World with the idea of displacing the natives, right? So it then becomes a question of, well, how many natives were there originally before we can determine how many people were displaced or not? Um, and so it turns out that every geographer and demographer realizes that about half of the New World population lived in central Mexico where the Aztec Empire was. Mm -hmm. And then about a quarter of the New World population lived in Peru where the Incan Empire was. And that leaves, you know, 10% to be sprinkled around the rest of South America and about 10% to be sprinkled around North America. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that means that all of the U.S. and Canada had only about 10% of all the natives in the New World, even though they're about a third of the landmass. And the reason why is because it was much colder and it froze in the winter. So it was much harder for early civilization to take root there. It's just like in the old world, um, Egypt and Mesopotamia became the cradles of civilization because you could grow the most food and because they were good river systems. And right. so they, they grew a lot of people simply because they had a lot of calories. So in North America, they didn't have that much access to calories. And so they had few people. And for most of Central North America, uh, U.S. and Canada, uh, they were still hunting and gathering. They had only recently learned to do corn farming just along the East Coast and a little bit in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get more calories. So populations were starting to grow along the East Coast, but it was still, I mean, maybe in the U.S. something like 2 million in 1491, and in Canada, maybe half a million people. Mm -hmm. um, so those are population densities, something like 1 one-hundredth as dense as England at the time, even though England, you know, in the 1500s wasn't very densely populated by modern standards. Right. So, so the reason why we see mixed race people in Mexico is because there were many more millions of natives and there are mixed race people in the U.S. and Canada, but they mostly got, you know, they're, they're people who have 1%, 2% native blood because in the beginning they may have married somebody, but then they just assimilated into the major culture, which was, I mean, natives in the U.S. were almost always outnumbered at least 100 to 1 mm -hmm. by settlers very, very quickly. So one of the big things dealt with in the book is trying to get an understanding of who were these people that came from Europe over to the New World and what were their intentions? Uh, with the people in our society today saying that their intentions were essentially genocidal or uh, to enslave or oppress or, or wipe them off this land so they could take it for themselves. That's one interpretation out there today. But many different peoples came to the New World. And, and I think another thing to take into consideration is the environment in which they came to uh, different tribal groups that uh, at times were hostile to each other. So the interactions with the Europeans that uh, first arrived, sometimes it was allyship in the case of some groups and other times it was hostilities. So uh, 
the I, I think uh, uh, we can get into uh, other things like race and that as well. But the what were the intentions of the people that came here? And uh, I guess we we need to start dealing with this claim that they were genocidal as well. Yeah. Well, so what I do is I look at the uh, Cambridge history of the native peoples of North America, which was published around the year 2000. And that is a huge six volume multi author work, all the best authors on indigenous societies in North America at the time. And mm -hmm. the word genocide is used precisely twice in all like three or 4,000 pages of the book. And that is only to say that genocide was not is not a uh, a good description of what was going on in the new world whether by intent or otherwise mm -hmm. so 20 years ago every historian every mainstream historian accepted that the idea of genocide was just so now we have genocide being accepted by most scholars including the canadian historical association right. um acting as though this was the intent and this was in fact the truth this is now everyone says oh this is the consensus amongst historians um and it's largely because people have been getting on the social media bandwagon it's very fashionable right now so historians are cranking these things out and if they use the word genocide in their title they're winning every book award and getting feted by the new york times etc mm -hmm. so the question is did they actually come over with genocidal intent and the answer is just like every historian before about 2010 realized um no because the major paradigm they were using was the same paradigm that the portuguese were using in africa and india and which the italians had been using for centuries in the eastern mediterranean and that was the coastal trading fort so columbus came over with the idea of creating coastal trading forts they assumed that just like in Africa and India, there was no way they were going to be able to conquer all those people. They, they knew they were just a couple hundred Europeans. Mm -hmm. So their main goal was to create trading posts. And they thought that it might be centuries before they would make inroads inland, if at all. They assumed that the native rulers were always going to be kings in India, in Japan, etc. And so they thought it was going to be the same way in the New World. So what happened differently, of course, was disease. The New World only had 10% of the global population, whereas Africa, Asia, and Europe had 90%. So their immune systems and diseases were much crazier, and the immune systems were much used to, to wild influxes of disease, such as the Black Death. Um, mm -hmm. And in the New World, their immune systems were not used to that. So their population plummeted by some 90% over the course of 100 or 200 years, often before Europeans even arrived. And so that made it in, you know, in such a way that it was much easier for the colonists to simply walk through the land, because in all of the U.S. state of Virginia, by the 1670s, there was maybe only a couple hundred people left. Uh, and that was nobody's fault. They had died hundreds of miles from the frontier by disease. Mm -hmm. Then in Mexico, where, you know, a lot of the natives died, but they still uh, survived in largish numbers, there was the tribal system, as you alluded to, which meant that since most tribes saw their rival tribes as inveterate um, generations long enemies, you know, they called them worse than dogs deserving of death. You see this one tribe will say this about another tribe all the time. Mm -hmm. Cortez could walk into Mexico city because he had tens of thousands of native allies who had been oppressed by the Aztecs. They readily allied with Cortez. They're the ones who supplied most of the manpower for his conquest. So, yes, that tribal system very much enabled Europeans to conquer more than they would have. But it also shows people were not thinking about race at the time. The Europeans weren't either, and we can talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but they were talking, they were thinking about political alliances, uh, plain and simple. Today's obsession with race is totally manufactured and ahistorical. Right. One of the fascinating things from your book uh, I think that 
is related to this topic is how uh let's say low lower class or middle class uh european people were quite eager or interested in marrying the new world native american societies because uh, essentially it was a type of hypergamy that they could raise up in in uh, class and status within society back maybe even back at home as well which which shows that they at least the the people who were interested in doing this they had some respect for the social systems that they were engaging with and they were uh, interested in uh, they they thought that these uh, noble people were uh, a class higher than them this this was something i thought was really interesting from the book it's really one of my favorite things that i discovered over the course of this research is that in the uh in the 16th and 17th centuries, and even in the 18th century, uh, Europeans went over to Europe assuming that these social structures were going to be there forever, just like they assumed in China and India. So um, because they were so obsessed with the idea of nobility uh, back then, um, they picked out the chiefs and the, you know, the relatives of the chiefs, and they were ready to assume that these were noble people. So Cortez and his lieutenants did everything they could to marry um, Aztec uh, princesses. And, in, uh, and Pocahontas was also considered a princess. And so her English husband was kind of accused of marrying above his station because he had dared to marry an Indian princess, mm -hmm. even though he was a commoner. And in Canada, we find the same thing. We find a French baron marrying the daughter of a chief and bringing her back to France to live as a baroness. Mm. And um, so this goes on in the French and English and Spanish uh, uh, coloni colonization processes. And absolutely, it shows that they actually thought that noble natives were actually of a higher social status than most Europeans. Uh, to me, that seems like sort of the opposite of racism. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. It, uh... So the in the Spanish case, uh, this term conquistador is used, and uh, you say in the book that it's used as an umbrella term, basically for any any Spanish uh, migrant, basically no matter what their occupation or intention was, and you. This is in chapter four. You make this interesting point uh, about how historians are, are studying this stuff and saying that everything to do with the Spanish, they're, they're conquistadors and they were bad and had evil intent. But you point out that there are other cases, say, the uh, the Russians in Alaska and what they were doing there, this gets largely ignored. And you, uh, I'm going to read a quote here, which I thought was really good. You said, the reason for this comparison was to show the extent to which ideology drives us to magnify some atrocities while ignoring others that stand in plain sight. It's the job of an objective historian not merely to lament and lay blame for tragedies, but to contextualize them and to compare them with similar events for the purpose of coming to a true understanding of their cause and context. So I liked the way you put that. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Well, I mean, we see this all the time, right? I mean, I... Um, uh, with I don't even really want to talk about the Israel Pal Palestine thing, but whatever uh, whatever side you choose, it's so easy for people to look at what the other side does as an atrocity. But if people on your own side are doing something bad, it's very easy just to gloss over them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a natural human instinct, and I'm afraid that historians who are supposed to be objective, certainly about things far in the past, with modern politics, it's more visceral. 
but about these things that happened hundreds of years ago. Now historians are acting just like political partisans might act today. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for example, Russia took over Siberia, killing tens of thousands of natives, and we never hear about that. And yet the U.S. and Canada, where the total, you know, number of massacres in the U.S. was actually less than 10,000 natives massacred before 1848, just less than 10,000 out of a population of a couple million. Um, and in Canada, maybe a couple dozen um, uh, people were massacred. Um, and, and then we ignore the fact that natives in the U.S. actually massacred more white people than vice versa. So the death toll, mm -hmm. you know, from native massacres was actually higher. Um, we ignore all of that. And then we call the U.S., illegitimate and genocidal, whereas nobody would say that Russia is an illegitimate genocidal country, even though when you look at Russian history, there's more of a claim to, to make that claim than there is for the US. Certainly, yeah. yeah. But I think that because maybe also because historians tend to skew left for various self-selecting reasons, during the 20th century, Russia was seen as the USSR and maybe a thing that the left didn't want to criticize as much. So then nobody tends to know about this, this kind of dark history of Siberia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we have the Zins of the world, you know, desperately digging up any sin that they, they can uh, paint on the United States. Mm. How much of, of this attitude towards... Uh, activism in in doing history is would you say that it's a fair characterization to say that these people they, they almost seem to hate their own society the way they uh, relentlessly criticize it do you think that's uh, too strong of a characterization well i mean you know um the Intellectual establishment in the United States since the mid 20th century has thought it was fun to play around with Marxism. You know, the obvious intellectual appeal of Marxism is that it promises an equal society, whereas the real world is, is nasty and oppressive in lots of ways. It's easy to characterize it that way. So historians were already skewing f towards this idea that it's the, kind of their job to critique capitalism, to critique the West. Mm -hmm. But before the rise of social media, you were always kept in check because there was professional decorum. You were always in the room with other people when you made a conference paper or made a pronouncement. And so you knew that there would be older historians looking at you and saying, yeah, but is what you're saying really reasonable? You know, is what you're saying actually based in fact? And there would be people right in front of you who would check you on mm -hmm. that. And that kept historians, I think, you know, even though they were left skewing, that kept them, you know, at least within the bounds of reason. There were there were voices that they cared about who would who would call them out. Hmm. Now, with the rise of social media, we're finding a new generation of historians who, you know, mostly uh, mostly live on Twitter. Um, and certainly maybe Elon Musk has ruined Twitter, but certainly for the last seven or eight years, that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm afraid I've, I've now encountered many historians whose main goal is to, you know, get 10,000 Twitter followers. And to do that, this one guy who was criticizing me, I noticed he had 120,000 tweets. Really? So that tells me he's tweeted 30 times a day, every single day for, I forget how many years, it was like seven or eight years to get that number. Wow. So these people, then of course, on social media, everything's an echo chamber. So you're always best friends with the people who, who like your tweets the most. Mm -hmm. And so these people's conceptions of what history is has been taken further and further from reality because their reality is their Twitter feed rather than a conference room filled with sober historians. Mm. And then, you know, these people get hired and then they hire other historians who think like them. And then we get the Canadian Historical Association making its ridiculous Canada Day statement in 2021 about genocide, mm -hmm. um, which turns out to be totally spurious. And in fact, most of the members of the CHA didn't approve it. But the activist board 
totally believed what they were saying and they put out the statement in the name of everybody. Wow. And uh, were you a member of that association because you did your graduate work in Canada? Did you join that association? Yeah, I, I keep tabs with yeah. it um, because I have a lot of friends who are in it, but I don't think I'm allowed to be in the CHA uh, anymore. And I've let my membership uh, lapse, mm -hmm. but I certainly saw what the board had been up to uh, and uh, kind of couldn't believe my ears. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I had never heard of this idea that uh, you write about in your book, but I found it interesting as well. I, I, I didn't believe it, but uh, it, you write about an ahistorical idea that the founding fathers of the United States stole or plagiarized their form of democratic governance from the Iroquois. There was a is it an Iroquois federation or some kind of um, mm -hmm. compromise or, or uh, agreement between different groups? So, uh, where does this idea come from that that uh, the founding fathers stole their or plagiarized their uh, the constitution or the idea of democracy from the Iroquois people? And is there any evidence that it's that it's the case. Yeah, well, I mean, again, I would think it was really cool if Native Americans had made a contribution to uh, the governing structures of the US and Canada. I mean, I hope that they do find some evidence that that's the case. I mm -hmm. mean, why not? It shows that we've been a hybrid society from the beginning a lot more than people realize. Yeah. But you know, in the 70s, we ended up with some Zin influenced campus Marxists who wanted to try about the United States, about its government, the Constitution, if they possibly could. And so we get a couple people um, pushing this idea that um, not only did the U.S. kind of uh, take their their ideas of democracy from the Iroquois Confederacy, but then they stole the credit. So they didn't even credit the natives, you know, a typical European theft move. This idea was thoroughly discredited in the historical literature until social media, of course, came along in the 2010s, and then everyone started liking tweets about it. And then suddenly now it's starting to take on a life of its own and historians start believing mm -hmm. it. Um, but it turns out there was literally two academics long considered fringe who were the sort of fathers of this entire theory. And it's been debunked in major publications such as the William & Mary Quarterly. Um, the fact is, uh, the colonies were already governed on a parliamentary system. The UK was a parliamentary system. Um, you know, after the Glorious Revolution of 1688, Parliament had the real power. The American patriots claimed that the king was in control, but it was really Parliament in the UK that had the real power. Mm -hmm. And they had set up representative government all across the English colonies. So it was no step. There was no major leap to create a, quote, democracy in the United States. It was the blueprints were already there for them. Mm -hmm. And yet now we're hearing that, you know, somehow the natives were the, the real heroes and that the Europeans were all oppressive and hierarchical. And so they had to steal this from the natives and then they even stole the credit. Right. The topic of Canada made me uh, reminded me of one other thing I wanted to talk about with with that, and and you discuss this in your book. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm in Japan here. I, I'm a Canadian, but I'm living in Japan. So I remember a couple of years ago mm -hmm. yeah, hearing hearing news from Kamloops, British Columbia, that at one of the residential schools where Native American children were uh, were taught that they had found a, a grave that contained over 200 bodies of children. And this was uh, an incredibly shocking uh, piece of news. And I think all of Canada probably mourned at this, was shocked by it, and even appalled by it. And I, I didn't hear anything 
more about this uh, until just a few weeks ago. I, I think it was the Vatican's uh, news program uh, did a piece on this, saying that there there actually were no uh, children in those graves. At least they haven't found any yet, and I I couldn't believe it. So I I kept looking into it more and more to to see if what they were reporting was true and and uh, I was really pleased that you dealt with this in your book I I'm quite shocked by by this news and what happened here why do you think the, the just the suggestion of this atrocity and everyone was so willing to to run with it and, and uh condemn the society as a, a a terrible terrible oppressive genocidal society and we don't really hear uh, about the fact that it wasn't true well it really reminds me, I mean, we thought that after the Enlightenment that the era of witch hunting was over, but I'm afraid with social media, we've created a new uh, way for mob mentalities to take over most, even the most reasonable people's thinking. So, because people were so disposed in the later 2010s to thinking that Canada and the US were evil genocidal societies that of course if graves were found, of course that's exactly what we've all been thinking all along. Mm -hmm. So it turns out of course that there were people hired to go comb the grounds of all these schools in the hope of finding mass graves and evidence of genocide and that kind of thing. So the it was already, you know, there were millions of dollars spent to try to find these graves. Finally, some, you know, relatively amateur person ends up finding disturbances in the ground. They report these as graves, uh, but no bones were even mm -hmm. found. Um, so in the end, that that's what actually happened. It was it was a false alarm. But even the Canadian Historical Association reported this mass graves idea. And they said, we, we know there's hundreds of bodies found and we expect there to be many, many more. That's, that's literally what they said in their Canada Today Statement of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and now they have egg on their face. They were completely wrong. They were completely carried away by the hysteria of the time, just like Trudeau was and pretty much everybody else, the premier of BC. Um, and so uh, it shows that even in the modern age, or maybe more so in the social media age, um, things that people want to hear, they'll take the most spurious little bit of evidence and the, they'll run away with it with a news cycle. And we end up with something very much like witch hunting. Mm -hmm. I mean, burning down all these churches for, for literally no reason, uh, except these, these graves that were supposedly found. Mm -hmm. So we have to remember with these residential schools that it was the 19th century in every boarding school of the time, you only need to read, you know, Dickens or any other book mm -hmm. uh, from the late, later 19th and early 20th century, uh, and you will find that people were die kids were dying off all the time in these schools. And so the residential schools were, of course, going to have children who died there, no matter how good or bad they may have been. Um, and the fact is, the number who died at the residential schools does not seem to be unusual compared to other schools when you compare the data. Hmm. And this is where me being an economic historian wants to see the numbers first before I jump to a conclusion. And I wish that a lot of my colleagues would do the same thing. Yeah. And with the schools, the reputation that I've heard from Catholic boarding schools was that they they all were were strict and quite uh, austere difficult places to to get through it in in some cases uh, even terrible uh, not in terms of their education cs lewis hated his yeah school. yeah i mean you you hear anybody who talks about schooling in the 1910s they loathed it it was in many ways mm -hmm. awful um you know i think with the with schooling and education it, there are probably a lot of cases where you know maybe the intentions were good but uh, the 
in, in practice how they went about doing it uh, in Canada at least was wrong. But you document in the book that there are many instances of of people setting up schools and uh, offering education to Native American children, and that this happened. Well, uh, there there are instances of this happening throughout the centuries, even, which I, I thought was uh, quite quite nice stories to read about. It is absolutely wonderful to read these positive sides of the way the European settlers were trying to make the most positive impact they could. I mean, just like volunteers today will go set up schools, they'll work in food banks. There have been people doing that. European settlers have been doing that for centuries, and yet we never hear these positive stories. Mm -hmm. Um, in Montreal, a school just closed that had been founded at the very earliest days, and it was set up by a couple of women who had migrated over and set up a school for Native American girls. Uh, and everyone claims, oh, this is, you know, cultural indoctrination, cultural genocide. Well, the first things they did was learn the native languages and write uh, books and dictionaries in the native languages, because mm. once again, they assumed the natives were going to be there forever. Yeah. So they were actually teaching Europeans to learn native languages, and they were assuming that if they taught natives to write their own languages, they would create their own native literature. Mm -hmm. uh, they already praised them. The Jesuits in Canada were praising them for their eloquence, for their oratorical skills, and they thought, we just need to teach them to write, and they're going to be just as uh, eloquent as uh, a Cicero. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's really what they were saying. Um, so the idea that all this schooling is somehow bad, the intention originally was to not have them assimilate into French culture or English culture, but actually for the cultures to coexist. Right. Um, the same thing happened at Harvard. There was a Harvard Indian college that was constructed in the 1640s, mm -hmm. and it had several graduates, um, you know, several of whom were major success stories, but eventually because of disease, uh, not enough pupils were able to enroll. Hmm. So it eventually died out, but that was the intention. You know, right after Harvard was founded, they also founded another school for natives. And the idea was that they would all be under the same Harvard mm -hmm. umbrella. It's astonishing. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so also in the book, you, deal with uh, the instances where there there were terrible things that happened. Uh, to me, the two of the things that stand out, uh, the, the number one thing that stands out was uh, the trail of tears. But I, I think you dealt with this uh, up front and, and uh, uh, you you did what you're asking the rest of your profession to do. You dealt with it in a balanced or, or neutral way, saying that uh, uh, you talked about the policies uh, se leading several years up to it and, and uh, how difficult it was for them uh, to march from the East Coast to, it, it was Oklahoma, and the fact that... Uh, Several, several people died along this march. With the Trail of Tears, uh, this whole event, why did the Jackson and Van Buren administrations ultimately decide to enforce this policy? Yeah, well, I mean, this is just it. So 50 or 60 years ago, there were people saying, yeah, the Trail of Tears was really bad, but it wasn't a genocide. After all, they were marched to Oklahoma, not to Auschwitz. I mean, the goal was to have them shift land rather than trying to kill them all. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it still ends up being one of the kind of one of the worst incidents of treatment of Native Americans in the United States, partially because the U.S. had signed these treaties with them and then ended up pushing uh, them out just when they were starting to find their feet. And so I think it was definitely unjust. Um, about 60,000 natives were moved from the American Southeast over to Oklahoma in inferior grounds. Uh, 
Uh, but why did Jackson decide to do it? Part always happy to see himself as kind of anti-Indian and, and pro-European settlement, so he was kind of bad in mm -hmm. that way. But in other ways, Jackson was a realist who realized that there were so many settlers trying to come into Georgia because gold had just been discovered that they realized for the native safety, the best thing to do at that point was to move them further west so the settlers didn't end up massacring them themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a pragmatic thing. There was no force on earth that was going to be able to stop hundreds of thousands of settlers moving into land held by a couple thousand natives at this point. So that was that was also a real politic kind of idea. Mm. Um, but the part of the story that doesn't get told by my colleagues who write books with titles like Surviving Genocide, you know, so now they're just saying the Trail of Tears was genocide and the natives barely survived. Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, only 3,000 out of 60,000 people died, so about 5%. So that's, you know, not normally a genocidal type of figure. It's pretty bad, but it's not that mm -hmm. bad um, compared to what you think when you think of the term genocide. Um, then you realize that on the Oregon Trail, the European settlers who voluntarily went to Oregon suffered about an 8 or 9% casualty rate from disease because it was the 19th mm -hmm. century. So the Trail of Tears percentage of people who died on it was actually less than the percentage of people who died in the Oregon Trail. Then the uplifting part of this story, and it's hard to imagine there would be an uplifting part, but the fact is the U.S. Supreme Court declared this to be illegal. So the highest court in the land said they should not move the natives. Um, there were intellectuals across the spectrum calling for Jackson to stop. There was a huge public outcry. And several senators actually resigned in disgust because of what Jackson mm -hmm. did. So the judiciary, the legislature, and a large swath of the, the public, including many priests and activists, were all opposed to this. So that shows that American society was not genocidal. Because, you know, something like at least half the population, only the locals in Georgia were all for this removal. Most everybody else was opposed mm -hmm. to it. But Jackson came from the South. So um, the, the fact is the story is much more complicated than you think. And what historians used to know is that, no, the term genocide just obscures all of the nuances. And so my book chapter is simply trying to bring back some of what everybody used to know, every serious historian used to know 20 years <laughs> ago. But now the new generation of social media driven historians are happy to just ignore. Right. Yeah. Uh... Picking up on that that last point, uh, you wrote uh, at one point in the book that young historians enter the profession uh, 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 sorry, let me let me say that again. they they aim at activism rather than the truth, and their professors don't do anything to dissuade them from 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 this they don't aim for a historic neutrality they're, they're just doing activism and would you say that how widespread do you think this type of uh, historic training is nowadays well you know it's basically normative when i was doing my phd 25 years ago um they were saying to me, write about some kind of oppressed minority. You know, so I was doing Spain. They're like, hopefully there were some slaves there. Hopefully there were Muslims. Hopefully there were Jews. Hopefully there were women that were all being oppressed uh, mm -hmm. somehow. But I said, no, I want to do the general economic trends of what happened in this society because we don't even have the most basic figures about what was actually going on. Um, and so my dissertation was a little less popular with colleagues, even though it eventually got published by Cambridge University Press. So it's published by the best press mm -hmm. there is. But it didn't win any major awards because it wasn't fashionable and cool. So already the fashion was dictating what you're supposed to write mm -hmm. on. And now um, with social media, again, the fashions have just become amplified even more. So now it becomes virtually impossible to write about something that's not fashionable. Uh, otherwise, you get, you know, uh, disinvited from conferences. Everybody finds out instantly that you wrote something that wasn't uh, towing the party line. Mm 
and and you get ostracized. Mm -hmm. And so since I wrote my spectator piece three years ago, you know, suddenly people aren't really inviting me to conferences anymore. And maybe that'll change a little bit. But, um, you know, and I still have plenty of uh, high profile publications coming mm -hmm. through. But um, I'm not fashionable for the time being. Maybe that'll change in five or 10 years. But at the time being, I'm persona non grata. And, you know, so in the end, social science, because it's not as much of a hard science, is open to so much interpretation that I'm afraid that uh, most of the scholarship that my colleagues are producing right now, um, I can argue that it's so tainted by bias and political bias specifically that one wonders whether it's even can be considered scholarship a lot mm -hmm. of it, you know, in the end, if it's that activist driven. Um, it's like everybody became a new Zin. It was okay to have some Noam Chomsky's and Howard Zins off to the side, as long as there was a center that was more reasonable. But now it's like the reasonable center has all shifted over to the Chomsky and Zin yeah. camp. And, and there's no, there's no counterweight to this argument on this lonely voice in the profession. And of course, I get tagged on social media as all sorts of uh, crazy, even though my publications are, you know, vastly superior to to most of the people that, that are criticizing me. But I get labeled as crazy simply because I'm not speaking for mm -hmm. the majority. I don't see any any change to that anytime soon. But I guess the the way to eventually uh, you had a great term for this that you're with this book that you're you're not doing historic revisionism you're doing historic restoration and i guess one of the paths back to doing truth based or or truth uh, the uh history where the goal is trying our best to uncover the truth is uh, by having conversations like these and publishing books like the one that you published and and also when the the majority of people are actively and sometimes in a hostile way against you i, I think sometimes it takes a little bit of courage as well but hopefully it, you know, over the next few years that we can start to uh, bring back common sense and and uh, you know, reason and uh, striving to try and uncover the truth again. Well, I really hope so. I mean, I have so many colleagues under the radar telling me, yes, I absolutely love what you're mm -hmm. doing. So I've had lots of profile, you know, professional public intellectuals, also just highly placed full mm -hmm. professors, writing me on the side and saying, thank goodness you're doing what you're doing. Thank you for doing this. So because of them, I know I'm not crazy. I know that I'm definitely barking up a tree that, that could mm -hmm. bear some fruit. But uh, when you listen to what the majority of colleagues are saying, you know, we're trying to organize a discussion of my book here at my own campus, mm -hmm. for example. Um, most colleagues, especially junior colleagues, are just rampantly saying, oh, we shouldn't even give this book a platform. They, they don't even want to talk to me about this because that would be seen as legitimizing my argument. Um, when the main argument I'm making is that 20 years ago, our colleagues used to disagree with you. That's all I'm saying, but that's now considered wow. too radical. So yeah, um, there are a lot of people who realize that this is ridiculous, but they're afraid to mm -hmm. go against the mob. Well, I hope I hope you guys are able to to have that discussion at the university because it sounds like yeah, uh, yeah. Well, there are some people who are definitely supporting me in positions of power, mm -hmm. so that is good. But they're getting a lot of pushback, especially from junior social media influenced mm -hmm. colleagues. Um, so we'll have the discussion, but it's not going to be broad because most people are too afraid to even stand in the same room as me hmm. um, for saying something that 20 years ago would be considered obvious. Mm -hmm. But I think too, by by having conversations like these where they'll be in the public sphere, uh, I know with my my own gauge when I 
discovered the the news about the residential schools and how there actually wasn't anything there, I could feel this response within me that said, I, I have had enough of this and uh, yeah. can't let things keep spiraling out of control because it's it, it's getting chaotic. It's getting crazy. And this is... It, it, it comes from academia, but it's it's permeated into uh, into all of the institutions within our society, and and uh, as you've been saying throughout our conversation, social media is feeding a lot of it. Uh. Yeah, it was originally American. It was originally based on a very strange, I guess, far left reading of American race relations, and it just kind of poisoned everything else throughout the Western world as a result. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, you're right. We need conversations like this. That's why I published this book. That's why my book's been, you know, selling very well in Canada ever since it came out. Um, people are really thirsty for anything like a pushback against a narrative we know mm -hmm. is one-sided. We know that the, the witch hunt is going on and that, you know, this whole idea that there's witches out there has been greatly exaggerated, if not totally made up. Um, and so, you know, one hopes that common sense will prevail, but the question is just how much damage is going to be done before before it re gets reestablished. Yeah. Well, I worried about that particular uh, topic or the what that potentially might uh, might be. Uh, I, I'd like to go back to a couple other topics from within the book it it seemed to me that in the let's say the first 3 to 400 years uh, of history after the Europeans made contact with the new world that the period uh, between 1830 and the late 19th century was a special period of history that saw uh, a lot of rapid changes occur because of changes in technology, technology mostly. The decline of the bison populations within the North American prairies. And why was this, uh, first of all, uh, have I got that right, that this was a, a special period of time in history where where changes were happening uh, happening a lot more rapidly oh yeah absolutely i mean so pekka hemelainen who's at i guess oxbridge right now uh, is a specialist in um the comanches and and just about natives in the in the central u.s in the 19th century um and he's written this book, Indigenous Continent, where he says, hey, it was only during the 1830s to the 1880s that most of North America flipped from being in native control to being in settler control. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason he gives for this, a lot of it is technological. I mean, the railroads and the telegraph made it way easier for uh, settlers to stream across the continent very quickly. Uh, nobody anticipated this in 1830 when they moved the natives to Oklahoma in the Trail of Tears in the early 1830s, they did not think that there were going to be settlers uh, streaming across to California in anything like the numbers mm -hmm. that they did. But the new technologies made it way easier, you know, the riverboat travel and then the railroads and the telegraph. So, yes, this was this time of very rapid change. It also was a demographic uh, change where natives were outnumbered about 100 to 1 at this point. The central U.S. and Canada had always been occupied by hunter-gatherers, so they were very thinly populated, and these people didn't own any ground. They had always migrated for, for you know, very widely. Uh, so, you know, they may claim some ground, but very, you know, broad uh, mm -hmm. stretches, uh, and often for only a couple generations before they moved to the next land, like the Sioux did. So... Um, there was a combination of being wildly outnumbered, massive technological change, and the fact that the natives here were hunter-gatherers, were always roaming anyway. Uh, and, and we may have maybe two or 3,000 people per U.S. state. I mean, that's the kind of really tiny populations we're talking about here. Um, so that saw 
most of North America flip from native to settler control in that 50 year period. So I partially argue that we blame the settlers as if for hundreds of years their goal had been to steal native land, when actually, if you're going to blame any generations of settlers, there's only two generations you can really blame for most of the theft, if you want to call it that. But for the reasons I just mentioned, it's kind of a, it's a mischaracterization mm -hmm. anyway. Right. There's a, a part in, in part four uh, of the book called Contemporary Issues, where you uh, give uh, a summary to one of the main arguments of the book, where you say there are virtually no grounds at any time in the 500 year history of European settlement in the New World for declaring European policies or actions against the Amerindians to be genocidal. This is at best a metaphor or at worst an inexcusable exaggeration that diminishes the victims of actual genocide. So I think this this is a point that's uh, well worth highlighting as well, that in our society today, when we call everyone a racist, it's diminishing the the potency of that word racist for people who are actually racist. And uh, by calling uh, a bunch of different historic events a genocide, uh, when these events don't completely um, comply with the, the various criteria that, that go into our understanding of what a genocide is uh you know we're we're throwing around these these words everywhere but we're and we're we want them to have the sting of of, of the and the power that they're meant to have but we're cheapening them as well by by using them everywhere and at all times yeah Completely agree. I mean, so in the U.S. now, uh, in 2020, they started, you know, CNN started calling anyone who voted Republican, so 50% of the population was a white supremacist, where white supremacist used to be reserved for people who attended KKK meetings and were actual white supremacists, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, now anybody who, who votes Republican is seen as a white supremacist. I mean, that completely dilutes the idea uh, uh, that we're talking about. And it's the same with genocide. So by calling what happened in Canada a cultural genocide, I mean, there were maybe a couple dozen Native Canadians murdered in the entire history of Canada in anything that could be seen as mm -hmm. cold blood. Um, to call that any form of genocide is obviously just reaching for a term that will resonate on social media. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are being deported, are being, uh, their children are being taken away to be re-educated. Talk about cultural genocide. Yes. Yeah. Um, that is obviously deliberate cultural genocide going on in Ukraine on this huge scale, millions of people. And um, hardly anybody talks about that. Certainly, you know, uh, on the left, they're, they're not uh, mm -hmm. shouting about it. And even on the right in the U.S., for some reason, they're not shouting about it as much as they yeah. should. The side can be applied almost everywhere that the West was. Uh, when 20 years ago, nobody used to make those arguments, absolutely is diluting mm -hmm. the term. And one of the points I forgot to bring up earlier, in, a, in addition to uh, the assumption that these societies were going to be here for forever, the... Uh, school programs, the uh, farming, trading, uh, was as soon as Americans had what they thought were effective smallpox, smallpox vaccines, uh, it, it was Thomas Jefferson, right, who, who wanted, uh, wanted these distributed to Native American Indians uh, as widely as possible to protect them from smallpox. So this this is a, a behavior that goes completely against uh, the narrative that Americans or, or Europeans were genocidal towards the Native American Indians. <laughs> 
Well, because specialists realized that most natives who did die died of disease, um, they desperately want to show that Europeans did everything they possibly could to spread disease mm -hmm. amongst the natives to make Europe once again look as bad as possible. And once again, we find that the evidence not only isn't there for that, but it actually skews the opposite way, if you look. So historians looking into this have found one incidence of a commander uh, trying to spread smallpox to the natives during the French and Indian War. That's the only time in American history mm -hmm. that's documented. And they're not even sure if that even worked out or went through. So then we see throughout the 19th century, as soon as smallpox vaccines are invented, as you said, from Jefferson and then even Andrew Jackson uh, instigated a federal program to inoculate Native Americans, which eventually ended up saving hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of lives, you know, at least several tens of thousands of lives and got many people vaccinated all throughout uh, the U.S. The Spanish were doing the same thing. Um, and so uh, this is the exact opposite of what all my students will say, because if you ask, you know, what did the settlers do? One of the first things any student will say, oh, they spread smallpox wherever they mm -hmm. could. Yeah. And with the uh, spreading of disease, we, we touched uh, on it a little bit earlier, but one thing that I think also is worth saying is that the, and I, I think you did mention this, that there wasn't, there wasn't really any blame for this situation. And Go, if we went back and ran uh, a counterfactual and ran history again, uh, I think it's pretty safe to assume that at some point in history, there's going to be contact between the old world and the new. And whether that was Chinese or the Russians or uh, perhaps the people from South Pacific Islands or the people in North and South America to novel diseases that they would have had no immunity to. And it, it seems very likely that uh, this kind of event was going to happen in history. Do you think, is that fair? If, if, if that's in any way wrong, please uh, offer a criticism. Of yeah, it. well, I mean, yeah, well, I agree. If there was any time that there was sustained contact between an old world society and a new, whether these were Arabs, Europeans, or Chinese, would mm -hmm. have been the most likely. Uh, diseases would have been spread at a catastrophic uh, rate, um, and we would have had a population collapse in the new world. Eventually, the native population would have gone back up, and they started to do that in Mexico after the mm -hmm. first hundred years. So... Um, that definitely would have happened unless, of course, contact had been initiated, you know, after the invention of modern, uh, invention of modern medicines in, in Europe right. in the 20th century. But obviously, Europeans were developing. One of the main reasons why they developed modern medicine is because they had explored all around the world and gotten a scientific mentality. So, I mean... That basically the invention of modern medicine would not have happened unless a society had already explored all around the world <laughs> first, I think. This this book, Not Stolen, uh, would you say, is it fair to say that part of it is historiography in a way and, and part of it is also to tell a story of history within our culture as well. It's it's addressed both to scholars and to the general public about how we remember and understand our own history. Uh, would you accept that it has uh, elements of both in it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's definitely meant to be accessible to as many people as possible to tell a story of our past, but it's also meant to tell um, the interested non-historian what's going on in the historical profession and just how much of a culture war is mm -hmm. going on now. Uh, and in fact, I think how distorted things are. And I think every member of the public who thinks about this realizes that historians have lost the thread. I think that's what a lot of people are thinking in, mm -hmm. in the public in general. But at the same time, absolutely, I want to be 
um, taken seriously by historians um, by engaging with their historiography quite mm -hmm. cogently, uh, point by point, showing where they're exaggerating, they're lying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but because the book doesn't have extensive footnotes, it is going to be relatively easy for his, some historians who want to, to just say, oh, this isn't as serious a scholarship as it should be. But there's more than enough footnotes and um, uh, uh, references to serious works that anybody who wants to can follow up what I'm arguing and see that it has a mm -hmm. factual basis. You know, you can't have everything uh, in right. one book. So I try to toe that line, and a lot of historians are taking the book seriously, thankfully, but opponents who want to can pretend not mm -hmm. to for the time being. But they would have done that anyway. I mean, they, they don't want to hear what I'm saying, and so no matter what I did, no matter how many footnotes I had, they would try to poo-poo the whole thing and pretend it doesn't exist. You reference lots of books uh, throughout in, in the actual text that that you're you're engaging with yeah. uh, the people who are making these arguments in, in print about genocide and and uh, that the land stolen yeah. uh, throughout the course of writing this book what's what's something that you something uh, that you learned or perhaps uh, expanded upon your knowledge that you thought was interesting? Well, I mean, one of the main things I think that's positive that I learned is that uh, there was so much peace in the first century and a half of settler native relations. There were only a couple wars that broke out in New England and Virginia. Um, and and then, you know, from the 1670s until the 1740s and 50s, we had very few conflicts between natives mm -hmm. and settlers uh, in North America. And even before the 1670s, there was a 50-year truce between the natives on the coast of Massachusetts and the, um, and the settlers as well. So the fact that there was so much peace and the wars we hear about are the few flare-ups that then make it into all the headlines about Thanksgiving and so forth. Um, that was a was a big surprise for me. Just how much peace mm -hmm. there really was, uh, just how much goodwill. Um, and then one of the negative things I learned is just how um, stories such as uh, you know the California Gold Rush have been spun into now they call it the California mm -hmm. Genocide, uh, and just how far some historians are willing to go to ignore all the context, to ignore the previous scholarship and only focus on massacre to make it look like everything was as mm -hmm. bad as possible. So I was shocked by that. In <clears throat> uh, this day of recording, 10 days from now, Americans will be celebrating Thanksgiving. Uh, based on the research you've done and, and the message in your book, uh, what, sh what should we what would what do you think we should uh, how sh should we continue observing this tradition uh, of thanksgiving in the way that uh, we've been doing uh, for many decades yeah yeah well i mean um it turns out that thanksgiving is really ancient it it actually dates from the 17th century and natives were uh declaring days of thanksgiving as well as the settlers so it was originally arranged as a sort of cultural meeting point between mm -hmm. the two cultures no one knows that of course but that that was the origin the uh loyalists who went up to canada um in the 1780s also brought turkey and pumpkin pie with them. So Canadian Thanksgiving is actually very old and is very much related to the same uh, roots mm -hmm. as the American one. Um, so to give up a tradition like this that quickly um, is something that I think you really have to think about because society, once they lose these traditions, they basically never get them back again once things die yeah. out. That's what history tells us. So I would advocate um, uh, looking at Thanksgiving as an attempt to bridge the gap between two cultures, which in many ways was much more successful than people realize. So today we only in the news, you know, goodhousekeeping.com will run an article about the bloody history of Thanksgiving. I mean, so everybody's talking about this. 
Um, but they're, they're once again cherry picking and exaggerating and they end up quoting from these 1970s Marxists once again who came up with the idea of indigenous Holocaust Day instead of Thanksgiving. So again, the most loaded term they possibly could. Um, we don't have to accept that because it was considered radical until 20 years ago. And in fact, the history shows that there was so much goodwill on both sides that we can acknowledge the downsides. Everyone thinks it's a tragedy that Native society disappeared from Massachusetts, but that was not the intention of the original mm -hmm. settlers. Uh, and we can see this still as uh, a sort of statement of unity, a statement of hope, which it originally was. And there's no need to, to look at it more negatively than that. Great. Well, I have... One last question for you. Uh, it's based on a, a quotation from your book that I thought was uh, great, that I want to, to read out and then have you uh, expand upon it. You write that your motivation for writing this book was and is to safeguarding human rights for humanity as a whole. This sentence, and I'm hoping you could, uh, as a way of closing expand upon this a little bit more yeah well i mean this was what everyone on both sides of the political aisle used to believe in right up till the 2010s i think so obama was saying you know we shouldn't be talking about race we should be talking about everybody getting along and creating hope and old school conservatives you know reagan was thinking sort of the same thing you know the main thing is is to safeguard human rights and to try to help everybody to get up by their bootstraps whether you agree with him or not that was the the goal was was to create these uh respect for democratic institutions and the value that democratic institutions can bring to uh to empowering everybody across society now, these very democratic institutions are under attack as being partisan in and of themselves by people who want to divide us all up by race or, or uh, you know, gender or whatever else mm -hmm. they want. And in the end, if we do away with these universalist human rights values that come out of the Enlightenment, all we're going to end up with is a retribalization of society and a backsliding where human rights actually suffer. We've never come up with any system of government besides democracy, which maximizes human rights in the world today. Every government which has high levels of human rights respect um, is also a democracy. And anything not democratic uh, is more authoritarian and has less respect for human rights. So those are the institutions we need to safeguard. And then we can work out all of our racial politics and everything else under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. But if we attack that umbrella, that's the only thing that's keeping the rain out. Yeah, very well said. So the book is called Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World. I really enjoyed reading it and really enjoyed the chance to talk with you about it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. It was great to have so many uh, great questions about it um, from someone who's read the book. I appreciate that Thank a you. lot. So thanks. Bye-bye.